It's a really interesting run. notion that the ambiguity of language is, is a feature. Yeah. And we evolved for millions of years yeah. to, uh, to take advantage of that exactly. ambiguity. Exactly. And yet no one teaches us the subtle differences between words that are near cognates and yet evoke so much more than you know, one from the other. Well, and yet, you know, when you're choosing words from a, syn a list of 20 synonyms, you know exactly the connotation of every single one of them. And that's something that, you know, is there. So, so yes, there's ambiguity, but there's all kinds of connotations. And in the way that we select our words, we have so much baggage that we're sending along, the way that we're emoting, the way that we're moving our hands, every single time we speak, the, you know, the pauses, the eye contact, et cetera, so much higher baud rate than just a vocal, you know, string of characters. Well, uh, let me just take a small tangent on that. <laughs> oh, Maybe... tangent, we haven't done that yet. We haven't it's done that. It's a good idea, let's do a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll return to the origin of life after <laughs> So, um, I mean, you're Greek, but I'm, I'm going on this personal journey. Uh, uh -huh. I'm going to Paris for the explicit purpose of uh, talking to one of the most famous, uh, a, a couple who's a famous translators of Russian literature. Uh -huh. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, yeah. and they go, that's their art is the translation. Yeah. And um, everything I've learned about the translation art, it makes me feel, um, it's so profound in, in a way that's so much more profound than the natural language processing papers I read in the machine learning community, that there's such depth to language that, um, I don't know what to do with. I don't know if you've experienced that in your own life with knowing multiple languages. Um, I don't know what to, do. I don't know how to make sense of it, but there's so much loss in translation between Russian and English and getting a sense of that. Like for example, there's like a, just taking a single sentence from Dostoevsky and, you, and like there's a lot of them. You could, you could talk for hours about how to translate that sentence properly. Uh, that captures the meaning, the, the 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 period, the culture, the humor, the wit, the suffering that was in the context of the time. All of that it could be a single sentence. Uh, you could you could talk forever about what it takes to translate that correctly. I don't know what to do with that. So, uh, being Greek, it's very hard for me to think of a sentence or even a word without going into the full etymology of that word, breaking up every single atom of that that sentence and every single atom of these words and rebuilding it back up. I have three kids and the way that I teach them Greek is the same way that, you know, the documentary I was mentioning earlier about sort of understanding the deep roots of all of these, you know, words. Um, and it's very, it's very interesting that every single time I hear a new word that I've never heard before, I go and figure out the etymology of that word because I will never appreciate that word without understanding how it was initially formed. Interesting. But how does that help? Because that's that's not the full picture. No, no, of course, of course. But what I'm trying to say is that knowing the components teaches you about the context of the formation of that word and sort of the original usage of that word. And then of course the word takes new meaning as you create it, you know, from its parts. And that meaning then gets augmented and two synonyms that, that sort of have different roots will actually have implications that carry a lot of that baggage of the historical provenance of these words. So before working on genome evolution, my passion was evolution of language and sort of tracing cognates across different languages through their etymologies. And that's and, fascinating that, <laughs> that there's parallels between, I mean, the, of course, the idea that huge amount. there's evolutionary dynamics to our language. Yeah. I mean, every single word that you utter parallels, parallels. What does parallels mean? Para means side by side, alleles from alleles, which means identical twins, parallels. I mean, name any word, and there's so much baggage, so much beauty in how that word came to be and how this word took a new meaning than the sum of its parts. 
Yeah, and that and those and they're just they're just words. They don't have any physical uh, exactly. And grounding. now and now you take they're these just words ideas. and you weave them into a sentence. The emotional invocations of that weaving are fathomless, and they're all all of those emotions all live in our in the brains of humans in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> in the eye, of, I mean, no, seriously, you have to embrace this concept of the eye of the beholder. It's it's the, the conceptualization that nothing takes meaning with one person creating it. Everything takes meaning in the receiving end. And the emergent properties of these communication networks where every single, you know, if you look at the network of our cells and how they're communicating with each other, every cell has its own code. This code is modulated by the epigenome. This creates a bunch of different cell types. Each cell type now has its own identity yet they all have the common root of the stem cells that sort of led to them. Each of these identities is now communicating with each other. They take meaning in their interaction. There's an emergent property that comes from a bunch of cells being together that is not in any one of the parts. If you look at neurons communicating, again, these engrams don't exist in any one neuron. They exist in the connection, in the combination of neurons. And the meaning of the words that I'm telling you is empty until it reaches you and it affects you in a very different way than it affects whoever's listening to this conversation now. Because of the emotional baggage that I've grown up with, that you've grown up with, and that they've grown up with. Yeah. And that's, I think, the, the magic of translation. If you start thinking of translation as just simply capturing that emotional set of reactions that you, evo that you evoke, you need a different set of words to evoke that same set of reactions to a French person than to a Russian person because of the baggage of the culture that we grew up in. Yeah, I mean, there's... <laughs> so, I, so, so basically, you, yeah. you shouldn't find the best word. Sometimes it's a completely different sentence structure that you will need matched to the cultural context of the target audience that you have. Yeah, the, it's, it's, I mean, you're just... I usually don't think about this, but right now there's this feeling as a reminder that it's just you and I talking, but there's several hundred thousand people will listen to this. There's some guy in Russia right now running, uh, like in Moscow, listening to us. And there's somebody in India, I guarantee you. There's somebody in China and South America. There's somebody in Texas and, and they all have different, Emotional baggage. They probably got angry <laughs> earlier on about the whole discussion about coronavirus and uh, <laughs> about some aspect of it. Uh, yeah, it's and there's that network effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's uh, it's a beautiful thing, and and this lateral transfer of information, that's what makes the collective quote unquote genome of humanity so unique from any other species.